Um, this is actually kind of a hard talk for me to do because uh, as opposed to the other surgeons on the podium, I have never have complications. <laughs> but I will certainly try my best to, uh, to do what I've, at least I've heard happens. Okay. I'm, um, I'm here to keep him honest. Yes, exactly. I have, I have no disclosures. So I guess the first thing is, I'm going to be talking about post-operative care. And I guess the real question is, why should you guys care? I mean, what's, what's the difference? We know how to take care of this. And I think it's important because as gastroenterologists, you should have a fundamental understanding of what we do in the operating room. Quite frankly, most of the acute complications that we see after the surgery like this involves the bowel, which is your purview. I think it's important for continuity care, not only because you're being a good doctor, but patients actually like you to be there. Patients who you've been managing for years on medication all of a sudden need surgery, they almost sense that they've been abandoned, which rightly you can argue if it's right or wrong, but they sense that they've been abandoned when you say, hey, by the way, go see Dr. Flesher and come see me after you're done. I don't think that's really good. And I think the other thing, which maybe is the more important reason, or most important reason, is that you can appreciate the adverse effects of preoperative medications that many of you use in our patients that we actually have to operate on. And I think Neil showed you some data. This is, this is a bit, you know, paralleling his data. We looked at preoperative medication use in our patient cohort. And you can see <coughs> biologic use in orange has, continued, has increased significantly, but yet there's still a large number of patients who still are on steroids and immunomodulators at the time of surgery. So the use of medications has not stopped. And many of these patients who we see uh, at the time of surgery are on either some, or as you can see in the orange on the, on the right, a lot of medications when they come to surgery. So when we talk about early complications, we're talking generally within 30 days of surgery, and they include the complications shown here. So we'll go through some of these uh, in some detail, but not too much. Uh, wound infection is one of the most common ones. It occurs in about 10% of reported cases, no doubt related to operating on a contaminated organ. The incidence seems to be lower with the use of fan and seal incisions. That's why you're seeing a lot of us using fan and seal incisions that are minimally invasive surgery, not only because of cosmesis, but also be, actually also because of less pain, but also so there seems to be a lower incidence of wound infections. In the operating room, we use these things called wound protectors, which look like almost saran wrap that covers the wound to try to minimize the incidence of infection, and the perioperative use of IV antibiotics. Now, many of these patients, despite all of this, still get wound infections. As I said, about 10% of cases. When you see a patient in the morning, let's say before the surgeon's been there, and you see a red raised area, until proven otherwise, that's an infection, okay? There is no role, repeat the word, no role, for IV antibiotics or any antibiotics in that patient. The patient needs the wound opened up. That's the treatment for a wound infection, okay? And there's no role for culture. The only time you sometimes do that, if you're considering, let's say, a diabetic or if you think a patient has a MRSA or whatever, but in general, particularly when you're working on the GI tract, there is little, if any, role for antibiotics or culture. That's open incision and drainage of an abscess, basically a wound infection. The other thing that's another complication that's fairly common is dehydration after ileal pouch surgery. We've been seeing this more and more. I don't know what the other experiences of the surgeons have been. And this is what happens. Let's say the patient has a three-stage procedure. So initially, you take the colon out. They end up with a terminal ileostomy. They go home. They have their entire small bowel in continuity. And they generally do OK, although they can become dehydrated and have nausea and ileus. We'll talk about that in a minute. But they're generally able to hydrate themselves. They then come back for their second of three-stage procedure where you're doing the J-pouch. The J-pouch then uses some of the small bowel, the terminal ileum, for example. It reaches into the pelvis. But then you bring up an ileostomy above that, and now you've defunctionalized all the bowel below that. And many of these patients now are coming in with dehydration. Uh, it's one of the most common reasons for, for readmission to hospital, which CMS considers a, 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 a sense of quality care. As mentioned, it re results from the proximal stoma replacement, a lack of a colon. This is very important that you educate the patient on what they need to do. They cannot just go home and drink pure water. They are going to have electrolyte abnormalities like you would not believe. They have to be told to drink lots of salty fluid, Powerade, Gatorade, et cetera, salt their food like crazy, things that their doctors have told them never to do, temporarily until the ileostomy itself gets reversed, usually in about two to three months. And there is some very good evidence that aggressive uh, uh, therapy by an RN with post-op phone calls to the house, making sure they're urinating well, that the urine is not too concentrated, can reduce the incidence of significant dehydration and obviously, therefore, readmission. Now, ileus. 
Ilias is the killer of all abdominal surgery. You can do the world's best surgery, you can sew an anastomosis together for nine hours and it can look absolutely perfect, and you get Ilias and it screws everything up. And we have no way to absolutely prevent it. it. Obviously, many of you have seen these patients, they're doing well, and all of a sudden they get nausea, they don't feel well, they start vomiting. And there's really the way to conceptualize this is that there's two different forms of ileus. There's the early ileus that generally occurs within four, let's say four to five days post-op when the patient initially tolerates food and all of a sudden they get these symptoms. These patients, you stop the diet, you put them on IV fluids. If they continue to vomit, you put an NG tube. There is little or any role for a KUB, okay? We always teach our surgical residents that you do test if it's gonna change the management of the patient. There is nothing on a KUB except for maybe if you're suspecting a gastric dilatation that's going to change what you're doing. So there's really little, if any, role for a KUB. And you, I noticed, you notice that I wrote down here that it seems that early ileus may be reduced with early advancement of a regular diet. So you're looking at me and you say, what's going on with this? Well, you know, when I was Gill's age, okay, what happened was is that I was taught in my surgical residency that you never wanted to feed the patient because you were thought that it was going to cause more abdominal distension, more nausea, more vomiting. You're going to get bloated, the wound's going to dehiss, and they're going to aspirate and die. That's what I was taught. And there were also concerns that the food particles would come down to the anastomosis and break down the anastomosis, and you get increased leaks. That's all nonsense, okay? That does not happen. And what we did a couple years ago is we actually looked at this scientifically, and we did a prospective randomized trial. So what we did is we took patients after major colorectal surgery, and we included, you can see 104 patients, which by the way, for a surgical study is pretty high. I understand it's not the 6,000 patients you guys get in medical studies. Okay, st study cohort of 104 patients, 50, approximately half of them got a clear liquid diet, approximately half of them got a low residue diet on day one after surgery. Look at the incidence of vomiting. Incidence of vomiting was higher with a clear liquid diet, on post-op day one, significantly higher. And even on post-op day two, even though it didn't reach statistically significant, you can see it was still twice as high. Look at the incidence of nausea. This is just a Likert scale to get a sense of how nauseous they were. They were more nauseous on a clear liquid diet. Antiemetic use for days, okay? Less with a low residue diet. I know this sounds like, what am I talking about? NG tube insertion, this concern that you somehow or another were going to cause, you know, nausea and vomiting, they were going to vomit and you're going to have to put NG tubes in. No difference. And look at the length of stay. Two days less with an intervention that costs nothing, okay? Prospective randomized trial. And in fact, this is the data that has suggested to me, and it makes sense. It's like a use it or lose it phenomenon. Feed the patient. Obviously, if the patients don't want to eat, they'll tell you. Many patients in the morning, they just don't want to eat. That's okay. But try to feed your patient if you can. Okay, and by doing that, you can reduce the incidence of ileus. The other type of ileus which we see is the which is the more ominous form, is the one where the patient initially is doing well, goes home, and then comes back, let's say five to ten days later. That's when you start thinking of a surgical complication, a leak, a piece of small bowel obstruction. That's where you start getting imaging studies, KUBs, CAT scans, gastrographic enemas, etc., labs if you need it. So there are important roles for imaging in that situation with a post-op ileus. What about an astomotic leak? An astomotic leak is the equivalent to a surgeon to your colonoscopic perforation. That feeling that you get, hopefully many of you have not had that, but I'm sure all of you had if you do enough scoping. When you see the mesenteric fat during a colonoscopy and your heart drops to the floor, that's the feeling that every single surgeon sh hopefully should still get when we see an astomotic leak. It's the worst thing we can do, we think. But 5% incidence, usually higher with a distant location in the bowel, usually occurs within the first week. Not all of those patients, however, need to go to surgery. If they're stable, they can be treated non-operatively with CT drainage if they have an associated abscess. They may end up with a fistula, but that's a calculated risk. If a patient's unstable, do not fool around with just watching the patient. That patient needs to go to the operating room. You need to be aggressive with that patient and resect the anastomosis, potentially, potentially do a temporary stoma. The thing you do not do is just put a stitch into the stoma and go home, okay? Um, there's a very important expression we talk about in colorectal surgery, and that is, don't screw up the screw up, okay? So when you have an anastomotic leak, the so-called screw up, be very aggressive and smart in how you're treating that patient. Don't start being fancy, okay? You have a patient behind it that needs to get better. What about intra-abdominal abscesses? Fever, pain, and what I like to call the dwindles. Patient goes home, they're just not doing well. They're just not, they don't eat, they're losing weight, Doc, I don't feel well. 
hey, I'm having some pain, I just don't feel well. That's the clinical suspicion that they should have an intradominal abscess. You can get a white count if you want, that's fine, but most of the time it relies on in imaging, usually CT scans. Um, it's okay to eat, obviously you treat them with IV antibiotics. The treat, obviously the CT scan will tell you the, the, uh, not only if there's an abscess, It'll also give you some idea of the size of the abscess. Usually the small ones are easily treated with antibiotics alone. They rarely require IR drainage. Quite frankly, our IR docs can't even put a pigtail catheter into a relatively small abscess. The larger ones, pigtail catheter drainage is very effective for that. The drain stays usually until the purulence and or the fluid abates. And there's, at least in the surgical literature, in my practice, there's no need for follow-up imaging so long as the patient continues to improve. Patient doesn't improve, you can do that. It's fine. What about a pelvic abscess? It's a little bit different than intradominal abscess. It occurs after you've seen what, what Dr. Ramsey showed you, ileal pugnal anastomosis. It occurs, you've seen them even after low anterior sections for cancer, et cetera. And the key symptom to suspect a pelvic abscess is a patient says, Doc, I can't sit. It hurts. They don't have fever usually, although they can. But if someone says to you three weeks down the line, Doc, every time I'm sitting, this is hurting, until proven otherwise, that patient has a pelvic abscess. And the reason it's important to know about and know about early is that it does affect long-term function of whatever anastomosis you're doing, and therefore you should be aggressive to try to find out, find out what that is with imaging. If it's relatively small, many cases, again, with antibiotics will, will, will work, but sometimes you need CT-guided drainage. The problem with CT-guided drainage and pelvic abscesses is they have to go through the gluteal muscle, and they're very uncomfortable for patients, but they're also very effective. And sometimes, depending on the nature of the abscess, particularly if it's communicating with the bowel, it does require an examination under anesthesia with not catheter drainage by IR, but actually transanal drainage that we do, obviously, through the anus with some, with, uh, surgically. Now, what about DVT? Neil was mentioning something about DVT in PICC lines in patients who were anticipating surgery. Uh, what about post-op? Well, IBD patients are also at high risk for DVT post-op. We know they're a hypercoagulable state IBD. Many of the surgeries are done in the patients with lithotomy position, which is a known risk for DVT, and many of these surgeries are very long. And some of the preventative measures that you can take are early ambulation, SCDs, that all of us know the squeegee, the squeegee things, and low-dose sub-Q heparin. One of the controversial things, though, is when do you give the sub-Q heparin? Some guidelines recommend that the sub-Q heparin should be given prior to surgery. Other guidelines recommend that you can be given any time within 23 hours of the surgery, and no one knows which one's the best. There are concerns that if you give pre-op sub-Q heparin, obviously at the time of the surgery, that somehow or another the patient's going to bleed in the operating room and you're going to have more bleeding. On the other hand, you may not want to do it post-op because many of, of the clots form on the table, particularly if they're in lithotomy position. If you don't have any, uh, uh, you know, any protection with heparin at that point, you might, might not be doing the patient a favor. And the other thing that's been very interesting is, because we know these patients are hypercoagulable, how do we know these patients aren't coming in with a clot already? And is it possible that they actually have an occult clot? And therefore, that would lead to a falsely elevated post-operative DVT rate. So what do we do? Just like we did with the early diet study, let's do a randomized trial. So what we did is we took patients, and we, half of them, we, all patients who came in for a major colorectal surgery had a duplex scan in pre-op. Okay? The hospital was very supportive of this. Then they were randomized at that point to either pre-operative heparin or post-operative heparin. And then we had a duplex scan in PACU right after surgery in the recovery room, and then we did another a duplex scan on day two. And we wanted to see really what was happening. And without showing you all the data, uh, this is all published data we did, but you can see there was a slight advantage. The problem is the numbers are very small. There was a slight advantage by giving preoperative uh, heparin in patients as opposed to postoperative heparin in terms of DVT formation. Some of the other things that we found was that there was no difference, however, in overall DVT rate, post-op DVT, or bleeding complications. So this issue regarding give pre-op heparin is actually not correct. It's okay to give that if you decide to do it. Most of us, I would recommend based on our data, even though it's not 100% uh, diagnostic, I mean 100% um, uh, robust, is to give it pre-op. But what was very interesting is that 4% of the patients who came into surgery in PACU, pre-op, excuse me, had a clot. They walk in with a clot. And yet, you know, so the question is, what does that mean? Well, you know, CMS penalizes you now if you develop a DVT in the post-op setting. So is that fair? The patient walked in with a clot. So what we're recommending, particularly in high-risk patients, i.e. IBD patients, that these patients have pre-op duplex scanning, 
And if there is evidence of a clot, either, either cancel the surgery or, or um, potentially just uh, screen them much more often, like do a duplex right after surgery, make sure they don't extend, et cetera. What about perioperative steroid dosing, steroid withdrawal, okay? We're all worried about this. Stress dose steroids have been the standard of care forever, I shouldn't say forever, for at least 60 years. They're thought to be necessary in patients on steroids at surgery. This is what I was taught when I was young. And in every patient was off steroids, but had any prior exposure within the past 12, 12 months. But if you look back at the data, where does this come from? This comes from two case reports in the 1950s that said you're supposed to get a steroid stress dose. And there's little objective evidence. So what did we do? We did a randomized trial. Okay, we compared patients who had low dose, low dose steroid to high dose steroid. And what we did is everyone who came in, they were randomly assigned to whatever dose of steroid they were on at the time, just a dose equivalent, okay, or they got, or they got stress dose. And we compared what, in fact, the difference is. And I think any genius can look at this and say there was absolutely no difference whatsoever between the patients who got low dose steroids or high dose steroids. There is no value for stress dose steroids. And if we look at even some of our secondary outcome measures, okay, let me just look here. These are some of like post-operative orthostatic hypotension, any orthostatic, any orthostatic hypotension. That was actually our primary, our primary endpoint is any hemodynamic instability. But you see there's absolutely no difference whatsoever. But yet even when you look at our secondary outcome measures, stole cold, stole cold the same. So there's absolutely no role for stress dose steroids. You give whatever dose the patient is on. If you had a patient on steroids who was on them for nine years and somehow another got off them the past month, Okay, and they go, and then they need major abdominal surgery. There is no role to give steroids in that patient. Okay, that's what I would recommend in your in your patients. And what about this? This is another complication that we sometimes see. There's a very interesting complication related to ileal pouch surgery. It's it's a portal vein thrombosis. And usually, what happens is that the patient goes home and they come back with some nonspecific abdominal pain. And you can see by my green arrow here, they come back into the ER, and everyone and their mother who comes to the ER gets a CAT scan, and this gets picked up. Okay? And the reason that this is fairly common in ileal pouch surgery is that it not only arises from the IBD hypercoagulable state, but because, as Fez had told you, sometimes there are tense tension issues in the operating room. As we're pulling down and trying to get this pouch into the pelvis, sometimes the superior mesenteric vein, some of the draining veins get squeezed narrow. And when they get squeezed down narrow, they, uh, they can potentially have less blood flow. The good news is that there's no long-term consequences to bowel function. It's rarely necessary to even treat them even if they're, unless they're symptomatic. The problem is I mentioned, some of the patients come back with nonspecific symptoms. You don't think it's actually related to the clot, but you're kind of almost forced to actually treat them because you're one, you know, in case something happens, you're basically doing a CYA factor at that point. Okay, that's what I want to talk about. Thank you. <laughs>